Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Anthony Scott. Um, we are here with today with my guest, John Simonoff, on another episode of Making It North, a show that's all about being creative and making stuff up here in the up here in the north of Maine and elsewhere in Maine too, as we'll see in other episodes. And we're going to have a good time today. But before we do, we have to uh, use our work in progress for a title sequence. Um, and th once again, I extend my invitation for anyone who knows how to do that kind of thing well, please help. Uh, but this is what we have so far. And action. <laughs> Making it north. Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Anyway, um, so uh, welcome, John. Thank you for agreeing to doing this. I, um, in the video that I made recently with Chris, he talked a whole lot about the kinds of work that we've done together. Um, and and I would have to say, even though I knew of you and your wife because of your capacity with local schools and working with students, including my kids, um, I didn't know you. Um, until we worked on that project together that we still work on, Star City Syndicate. Um, yeah, yeah. But uh, I've really enjoyed getting to know you and seeing and seeing your action and your your brain in progress um, <laughs> and, and, you, and your hands in progress on that bass guitar. Uh, but before we get into um, into that side of things, which is kind of the meat of what we do here and making it north. Um, I just want to ask you about some other things, get your, get some background and have you share some other things that you work on. Now okay. you, um, is the official title music director in Ashland schools? Is that? Uh, I, yeah, I guess, I guess the official title would just be music educator, music teacher. It's, it's a, because, because Ashland, is a pre-k 12 school it's kind of like multiple things because i'm teaching little kids like if you if you're a band director like if you just teach high school band you you would guess you would be the the music director uh but since i'm doing like elementary too and you know they don't usually go by director they're usually just like the music teacher i would call myself just a music educator music educator yeah yeah um i i think i think that's a good title because just to say music teacher gives it gives it that could be a lot of different things you know music teacher could be someone who's basically just introducing the basics of music to elementary school kids or but by saying educator that's a little broader because yeah. you definitely wear a lot of different hats in yeah. that particular <laughs> job um which is not uncommon um for for musical educators up here in the county and other rural places in the nation i would assume where mm -hmm. there's lots of schools depending on you or, or at least lots of different grades depending on you talk about some of the different hats uh that you wear there in ashland in ashland so yeah uh ashland is a is a small school i would say like um i want to say under 300 kids pre-k 12 it might be a little bit off on that number but it's 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 tiny um and it's it's got just one music teacher which would be me music educator would be me um so i i'll bounce between all the grades every day like I teach high school every day I teach middle school every day but I also teach elementary you know one of the grades of elementary like pre-k or something like that every single day too um, so like it's not unusual for me to have you know 25 year olds in the room and then 10 seconds later I've got 30 18 year olds you know <laughs> it, it's yeah it changes it changes you know real quick because the the day is is packed um, uh, I would say Let's see, it's been it's been so long since I've been in school since we're on lockdown right now. I got to think of my schedule for a minute, but uh, you know, I start I start the day with high school, and then they leave the room at like eight thirty or something, and at eight forty, I've got whatever elementary I'm going to see, and then I'm teaching some lessons, and so uh, many hats, like you said, like I'll be doing um, you know little kids songs, singing Marietta Little Lamb, or teaching that to like a fifth grader, and then all of a sudden I'm working on an all state audition piece with a high schooler um and then after you know that's that's till 2 30 and then you do, you do your after school stuff like your uh lessons you might have or um play practice and stuff like that it's it's anything i shouldn't say anything but um most of the creative things that happen in the school i have some hand in and i and i love it it gives me a chance to do a whole bunch of different stuff so um it, it, it many hats like you said is is an accurate way to say that because uh 
I would be every half an hour or so putting on something different. And that's just the way it is. And I, I, I love it. It's been super fun. So yeah, it doesn't sound like there's a such thing as a boring day. <laughs> yeah, you're scrambling too much. How many students would you say you actually teach? Yeah, uh, well, so every, I got all of them that are like pre-K five, they, I see them all at least once a week. Um, so that's gotta be over, over 100, over 100 for sure. Uh, middle school, I see probably 40 of them. High school, I see 35 to 40 of them too. Um, I mean, our high school, I think is like, like 70 kids or something like that. I, I, I see about 50% of the, the middle school, high school, and I see 100% of the elementary. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, whenever, whenever grades are due, that's a lot of <laughs> work. And then just grading, you know, I would think, I don't know, I've never, never uh, had, a, you know, done a music program, especially an elementary program. Um, but I would think there's a lot of grading and papers and keeping track of it. Yeah. That's a lot of records and things to keep track yeah. of as well as individual yeah, sure. student, uh, you know, uh, progress and how they're doing on the different concepts and classes, you know, um, yeah. of course you have them basically all year. It, it's uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, it, it's, we, you, you're right. Like it's a lot to keep track of, but I'm one of the only teachers, I guess the art teacher at our school too is in the same boat. It's like, um, I'm, I might like have to keep track of whatever number of kids it is, but I'm the only teacher that's going to see that kid potentially from pre-K to graduation. I might have that kid every single day, you know, and that's really cool. So I get to forge a really unique relationship with, with kids. We, you know, uh, like graduation time, we do a, what's called class night. Uh, we go and the teachers talk about the kids and a lot of the high school teachers will say, you oh, know, this kid was really great. And, you know, when I had them junior year and um, they're, they're a hard worker. And I noticed that when they were a freshman, so I, mean, I can, I can go up there and be like, yeah, when this kid was five, they were a pain in the butt, but they got better. You know, so uh, <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty, it's pretty unique. And I, I really like that. I, I like connecting with kids and watching them grow over 12 years as opposed to just one or two years. Um, and we're a small school. So like everybody knows everybody. So that's, you know, every teacher knows every kid, but I get the experience of teaching them and helping them develop uh, I get to watch them play their first note on a trumpet and I get to watch them finish their last concert on a trumpet. And like, not everyone gets to do that, uh, yeah, even, yeah. even in the music world. So it's pretty cool. That is really cool. And I, let me hazard a guess that sometimes you even get to experience their passions and their musical interests even after graduation. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's definitely true. Uh, um, I've had, three students that actually like went off into becoming uh, went into the music field after which is which is very cool and i had i can't even count how many but you know still play and they come back like we have a, a basketball season you know and the, the we have the alumni come back and play games with us i get to see kids pass that time we had a, a some community groups um we had the, the big course called the Roostic River Voices. We had, I had former students that were in that. Um, I direct the Umpy Band. I have some students that are in that. Uh, one of our fellow syndicate members, uh, Casper, um, played Barry Saxophonist, just released an album, uh, sent it up to me. I got a, my copy a couple weeks ago. Uh, and like, you know, I'm trying to, trying to make it big in the music world. So that's, that's very cool. They, the, to different degrees, but definitely get to see it after, after graduation too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've gotten to hear some of Casper's stuff online, um, and he's he's really, really got a great ear for for putting all the pieces together. You know, mm. it, one of the hats you wear, um, and I don't know if you do this so much within the school there, but I know you wear the hat of obviously director you do, but also composer, arranger, um, as well as just musician yourself. Um, yeah. You wear all those hats, and it's interesting to see Casper putting on some of those other hats too, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and doing a good job at it. Because, like I said, I've heard some of his pieces. And there, there's some, he has a really great sense of how to put those together. Yeah. Um, and by the way, just to plug Casper, I don't have one of those albums yet. So <laughs> um, I'm going to be uh, hitting you up, buddy. Um, Cause I really enjoy your stuff. Um, so you mentioned the umpy, the umpy band um, mm -hmm. and some other community projects. Talk about, talk about some of those other hats that you wear outside of the school um, and talk about the different, veins of kinds of musical hats that you wear. Gotcha. Uh, okay. So, um, yeah, as I said, I direct the uh, Umpy Band. It's a community uh, concert band. Um, we, we were rehearsing every Monday at Umpy before the, the, the lockdown kind of stuff happened. But um, 
we've got like middle school students that, that some teachers bring over all the way to retired people. Like it's, it's just this huge range um, of age and ability and personality. It's just really cool that all these different people with all these different backgrounds can come together and we make music together. And I get, I get to kind of be in the center of that. Um, I will say that like I direct a band every day at, at school. That is a very different experience doing the umpy band because <laughs> like if you're teaching a high school band, there's a little bit of a range in there that, you know, most kids are going to fall into. So, so when you're picking music for that, like it's, you know, you have a pretty good grasp that, of where you should be when you're teaching um, a community band, like the range is, I can't fit my hands on the screen. <laughs> um, it's, it's so much bigger. So like, like I, I, we've got, again, like professional music teachers, people who do it for a living. And then you've also got this little beginner. I, uh, last concert, we had a, I think she was a sixth grade French horn player who's just starting. It's like, it's such a good experience. French horn in sixth grade. Yeah. Now, I, I, the only brass I played, I grew up in band playing the trombone. Um, and, uh, but all the, you know, the other brass players, the ones that were used to, because usually if you had someone who went to French horn, they started off on trumpet a lot of yeah. times, right? Uh, and they would say all, all day long that the French horn was, was one of your hardest brasses. Oh, it's like, super, it's super tough. Yeah. Um, wow. I, I mean, we, <laughs> we could talk about the, we could talk about the, the, uh, but yeah, be one being like young and starting a hard instrument, then sitting next to like, I don't know how the, I'm not going to guess the age of people in the band, but they're definitely older, like, um, an umpy, uh, umpy professor, uh, former professor Sue Bodet. You know that name? Yeah. I know the name. Don't know the person. Yeah. yeah. She, she, she plays in it. So she's retired now. You know, you're sitting, you're a little sixth grader next to a retired, playing the same instrument. They're, they're helping each other. You know, it's, it's just a cool thing to see. Um, and it's good for everybody involved. Uh, so that's, that's a real fun experience for me. Um, the other community group that's not going on anymore would be the uh, River Voices. Yeah. Uh, Larry Hall's kind of brainchild. Uh, community chorus we had i think at one point over 100 members which was pretty impressive and uh for, for my role in that is it was again funny uh like i played bass for it um but i also as as anybody who knows larry he has you playing sometimes trombone or playing tuba or something percussion like yeah we we had no budget uh to make music for these hundred piece choir like i was arranging music all the time for that group so is larry um and sometimes directing it which chorus choral directing is not my favorite thing to do but it was fun in that capacity because you know it was just such a huge group um you know how you have your your facebook memories uh come up once i had one i want to say it was like two weeks ago that was like i can't believe i'm spending my saturday arranging dancing queen for larry hall but here i am or something like that <laughs> Because that, that's the kind of person Larry was. He would he would be like, John, I don't I don't know how to arrange this song. Could you do it for me? I I know he knew how to arrange that song. He just <laughs> he wanted me to have to spend my day arranging Dancing Queen or whatever. So. Yeah, that was his way of delegating a lot of yeah. times. Yeah, yeah, the great Larry Hall. Great, um, uh, you know, a lot of what you know we're going to talk about today is it's already proven to be the case, and and I know a lot of really what we covered with Chris in that video. Um, you know, we owe a lot to to Larry. Hall. I mean, yeah. two, three. what would the music programs in the county be without him? <clears throat> and uh, miss him greatly. Um, he was just a wonderful, wonderful man. And and uh, one thing that seems to come through everything that you're saying, and, and the, some of the Star City Syndicate stuff that Chris and I spoke about, is the word community, and how, how these creative, these collaborative creative efforts really form bonds, and are constantly feeding value back into the community and f making making for tighter relationships i love that 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 description of the sixth grader sitting next to the retired mm -hmm. professor and they're helping each other and then you knowing these kids from from k to 12 and that's just that is what music in the county the musical all the music in the county is all about it's all about community man and, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just a cool thing to get to be a part of um now you also mentioned another hat briefly uh, and, and some wouldn't realize this. I mean, if they'd been out and gone to any, any of the productions, they would have realized it, but maybe other people who haven't gone to productions would know this, but the musicians we have, have in the county, especially the ones that are, you know, that are uh, more accomplished and, and more professional, um, they come in handy for, for drama and play as yeah. well. Talk about some of those, some of the experiences that you've had over the years where you were in the pit crew for um newsies or for annie or whatever 
Uh, so yeah, uh, I um, actually I started playing. Uh, so l most people don't know this, but I was actually a pit musician in high school. Uh, like I would call it professionally because I was getting paid for it. But you know, yeah. I, I don't know what the theater was called Lakewood Theater in Madison, Maine. Um, and I was a pit musician there for four years before I went to college, hmm. which was pretty cool. Like a very very interesting experience to get to play with me there. I love I love playing um, shows. I love playing in the pit band for for uh, theater productions. I uh, can't remember what my first one was, but like, I don't know, some, some, some old show. And I continued that through college. And when I got up into the county, um, person who used to play piano for the Prescow shows uh, messaged me and said, I need a piano, uh, I need a bass player for the show Susicle. Um, I heard that you play bass. Would you, would you want to do that? And I was all about it. Uh, and that would be my first year. So I think I've done 12 product, 11 or 12 productions at Prescott High School. Um, I've done a few at Holton High School. The drive is a little bit uh, far to do, so I don't, I don't do those as often. And I've even done some um, pit bands at Ashland when we have enough kids to run a musical. We've done some shows there too. It's, it's, it's a, a pretty, pretty good outlet for me. I really enjoy to do it. And it's been fun. Like I, I don't know many kids at Prescott High School, but a lot of them know me now, which is, which is kind of, yeah. kind of interesting because I can say, hey, Mr. Simon often say, oh, I don't know you, but hey, um, <laughs> but I get to get to watch them kind of develop too. Uh, the, the shows are always, uh, the reason I like, I think the reason I like them is the shows are always interesting. Um, and what I mean is like, you never know what's going to happen, especially with kids on stage. Yeah. Uh, and you know, technology, sometimes things don't work. Kids drop lines, songs. You have to be on your toes uh, to play shows at like the community level. And I find that just really exciting because it's, it's, it's never the same thing, even though you're playing the same songs for two weeks straight, they're never exactly the same. Um, and you know, there's always little interesting things that happen. Like, uh, I can't, what was the name of the show? I want to say it was the pajama game was the name of the show. It was uh, Prescott, Prescott High School was doing it. And there's supposed to be a, a, a scene where he, the actor like records his voice into an answering machine and then he sings a duet with himself, which is kind of a cool thing. Whoa. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> technology didn't work that night. Like the, the recording wouldn't play. So uh, Jay Nelson, he used to teach chorus up here, is singing the part from the pit and, and like it's, the timing's all funny because there's no echo the way it's supposed to. And it's like, you know, this is, this is why I like to do it because it shows how fast you can think of a uh, think as a musician. And it shows like how good these pit bands really are. Even though a lot of times people might go to the shows and they don't really realize like how much work goes into that. When your piano player has to change the key of a song and the whole pin has to follow on the spot and you can't like talk about it because there's a show going on. It just, it makes you feel one energized and helps you kind of like, I don't know, just, flex flex your chops a little bit i guess so yeah. uh that's that's probably the funniest thing that i can think of that's happened up here is that that technology not working and having to sing in a different key all of a sudden but the shows are always just i don't know interesting and you get to spend a lot of time with your fellow musicians too which i i always enjoy some yeah yeah there's, there's you know the music and the scores for for a musical performance it's 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 a very unique thing because it's it's like music starting at certain times as acting is still going, and then it turns into a full-blown sung thing, and it's just more organic, and it's, it's really, it's a cool art form. It's a very cool art form, and, and with it, as you said, with any performance, you never know how it's actually going to go or turn out, yeah. and the market, it's or the, a, go ahead. Such a, like, cool conglomeration of every every art form. Like, there's music, and there's theater, and there's dance, and there's set. Like, it's everything combined into one, and... Yeah. Uh, so it gives everybody a chance to be a part of it too. And there's your community, you know, connection right there is everyone is involved in the show in some way. And uh, that's really, that's really why they're special. I think part of why. Yeah. They're special. yeah I have thoroughly enjoyed it. My, when my daughter graduates um, here, not the end of this year, but the end of next year, you know, our direct connection to, to the theater things going on will be gone. So I'm kind of dreading that, but there's just because my daughter is not going to be here and to be a part of the place, there's no reason why I can't continue to go and watch those kids because they do put on some really good, put some good work into that. Um, as far as people knowing you, Prescott, there's another reason kids around here know you in Prescott. In addition to you being the pit crew for their productions, uh, someone 
that has a regular input into their lives is closely connected to you. <laughs> and that would be your wife. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and so, yeah, t- uh, talk about, talk about how, um, how creativity in, in these musical projects has kind of, has kind of uh, given you and Jenna a way to really connect and, and has impacted your relationship. Uh, like, um, uh, we, I went, I was playing for the uh, jazz choir. Yeah, that's sorry. I mean, to come up with the orders, the jazz choir. And I walked into the rehearsal right before they played for state, their state, uh, our district audition. And one of the, one of the girls, I remember which girl was like, Mrs. Priest, do you know that that's Mrs. Simonoff's husband? And I said, like, yes, I did actually know that. It's like, uh, I don't know, kids don't always <laughs> make the connection that like, we know each other <laughs> and we are, uh, we are share a, a, not only a last name but a, a home together and like a life together. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I kind of that story popped in my head. What, what was the question you were asking about, Jenna? I was just asking. It's interesting to, that when you you have your you know your spouse or your partner, how you know when you can share something that you're both passionate about like, and that and it's something that's creative. I just I'd like you to talk a little bit about the impact of sharing music like that on on the dynamic of married life and, and just uh, gotcha. your relationship gotcha. yeah yeah um you know it's it's actually funny like uh there's a lot of married or couples that are musical up here you have, you have the diets and the kinseys um that are that are involved in the in mis- uh, priests um you know it, i i think the art form it, it it brings people together in in a really intimate way um like when you play music with somebody you you learn about them in a way that you can't, I, it's just, I guess it sounds kind of pretentious, but like you learn about them in a way that you, you can't always explain in words. Mm-hmm. And it helps you see characteristics and things about that person that you might not notice all of a sudden. Like I, I, I and my wife is not in the room. I'm not saying this just, <laughs> just to say it so she can hear me, but uh, like Jenna is a super compassionate, caring person. Yes, and yes. when, yeah, when I, when we play music together, I see, I see that. I saw that from, you know, how many years ago it was, but like there, I, I could see that kind of raw quality of her. And I was, I, 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 I think music helps us learn more and know each other better. And that's why it draws us together. Um, for, for Jen and I, we don't like, we don't, do the same things musically. Like she is a very strict, like wants to teach in elementary, a lower um, grade. I like to teach the, the upper grades and like instrument wise, her instrument is a, is a melodic, you know, um, kind of a in your face and my instrument is a background. Like we, we have very different musical presence, but like they complement each other. And I think that has something to say for how we complement each other in married life, I, I, <laughs> I guess. So uh, it, it's, I don't know. I think, I guess that would be how I would, I would define it. Like we, we've, we've been able to, again, kind of like quoting a movie, I think it is, but we've been able to kind of complete each other in a sense. Like we, we are other, other pieces of the puzzle that can come together and, um, and, and make something special. Yeah, absolutely. And when you have your own projects, holy cow, you've got your, you know, an audience and a, someone to do some critique and help you right there in your house, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and also that relationship and that sharing that love for music has impacted the house itself, right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember when you gave me a tour of the house um, and, and I saw, you know, the space that you had dedicated to, to the music, to the making of music and the instruments and stuff. It was beautiful. Yeah. Um, now, you guys also share another endeavor and it's connected to music. Uh, but it's not just connected to music. It's also connected to, to, um, to your lifestyle and your diet. Um, yep. And that's your blog, Jazz for, for Veggies. And tell us about that. Uh, so, yeah, we, we run a blog. It's just a hobby uh, for us that we started, I don't know, I want to say two or three years ago now. It's been going for a while. It's called Jazz for Veggies. And it, we came up with the title because we wanted to kind of include um, our creative outlets. Like, she likes to sew in music, and I like to do music. So, Jazz was that. And Veggies. Um, food uh, because we like to cook and we are not chefs by any means. We are amateurs at best, but it has been super fun for us to experiment and learn in the kitchen as well um, to have that kind of other place to just to, to try things out. So we called it uh, Jazz for Veggies and it's a blog where we just post, I think we, we tend to post every Tuesday and we bring up, you know, kind of whatever we want to talk about for the week and we might only have our family members look at it or, or something, but that's okay. It's, it's really for us just to have an outlet. Uh, 
but it is a, a music blog unless it's also a sewing project blog for Jenna because that's something that oh, she does a lot of. Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a cooking blog um, because as you said, diet. We are we are vegans and we try to live a very green lifestyle. So we've been using that as our kind of our sounding board and to bounce ideas off of and talk about what we've done in case anybody reads it and says, oh, that sounds kind of cool. I think that we've done something good. So it's been a, a, a really nice outlet for us. Yeah. And that's, that's just a cool potpourri of things in one blog, right? Real yeah. life stuff, music, uh, diet, and sewing. I mean, it's just that, that to me is, is kind of the epitome of, of, the creative people I know anyway, it has been my sense that creative people are creative. And I, by the way, I think everyone's creative. I think the only reason some people think they aren't is because the world and life or whatever has suppressed it and made them feel like they don't have anything to offer. And mm -hmm. I think that's, I think that's a shame. I think, I think we people, I think, I think there's a bit of creativity that goes into plumbing, right? I think, I think, you know, you've got to be creative to problem solve and come up with solutions in, when you're doing carpentry or when you're building or when you're gardening, right? So I, I think everyone's creative, but whenever, whenever you, you have embraced that side of yourself, the way, the way you have and the way Jenna have, has, um, um, I think once you open yourself up to that realization that I do have some interesting things I want to say and do and, and, and come ideas that I want to put into shape, I think it starts manifesting in other areas that maybe we're not, we don't consider ourselves expert in like, like the kitchen. I love the kitchen. I, it's a place where I get to do creations, but I would not by no means consider myself to be a chef. I'm just not a chef. I think I cook some pretty things, some good things, pretty good. Then some things that don't turn out so good. Um, but uh, yeah, but it's just that once I'm open myself up to how to, to that creative side of the brain and how it works, then so that your, your blog, First of all, it sounds interesting and totally, totally cool. It's going to hit all these different points that people are interested in um, and expose them to other things they didn't think about before. But it's also just a great sample of how creative people are curious people and they, they go and they try stuff and they experiment. It's, yeah. Yeah. I, I think you're exactly, exactly right that everybody is creative. I 100% I agree with you. And I think we all just have to, one, let our, let our, get our ego out of the way a little bit and try mm -hmm. a little bit. I think you are, you are right, hitting right on the nail. And, and, and so the blog is, is for us and people can read it and hopefully get something out of it if they want to. But um, it, it, it was never, it's never about like making sure that people read it and like we're not, we're not the authority on anything, but <laughs> we all have good ideas and you can learn every day from anybody. So why not share? Yeah. Because I, I, there's no, there's no harm in it. I don't think. Yeah, absolutely. 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 Um, and who, by the way, who did the artwork, uh, for the, for the, for the page? Cause it's oh, the artwork, uh, the artwork actually, so, uh, Casper, um, oh. made, when he, when, when he was still, I think it was a junior, uh, in high school made the, made the artwork. I, I, uh, asked cause he is a very artistic person all around. So, uh, he very made example, the artwork. creative yeah. person playing yeah. music, composing, drawing. Yeah. Yep, that's right. That's right. And then I, I took it over to a, a, an artist here uh, in Prescott, Rod Brewer, to make it like a digital, uh, a digital artwork. But the, the artwork is just basically a tracing of what Casper did to make it. He just put it into a digital file for us. So yeah. um, Casper, Casper would be the artist. I didn't know that. Very yeah. cool. Yeah, it's a, it's a real cool too. I think it's, I think it looks great. I think it looks great. Yeah. I've always loved the look of that. Do you guys happen to use it anywhere else besides just digitally on the page? Do we use it? Uh, well, uh, we yeah we do a little bit we have um uh we were able to print it out as a logo so we have a couple shirts with it on it just right for the fun of it and uh i think that's i think that's all we've used it for is the shirts and the in the website but um we do have the ability i guess to make it into into more if we want to we just i haven't i haven't haven't done that yet if you if you ever put it on a ball cap i want one so okay cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely <clears throat> okay so well you shared with me a a lot of Sam, several samples of some some of your compositions that you mm -hmm. put together. Um, yeah. Do you have any preference for which one we play first? Oh, uh, gotcha. Let me let me look at the list I sent you again. Uh, oh yeah, Forest is the first one. Yeah, let's. Yeah, that one is that one's a pretty cool. One. I go ahead. Okay, bring it up and see what happens here. What uh, software do you have this on? Is this Sound uh, SoundCloud? Uh, this is, I shared it to you through Google Drive. Um, okay. I don't have it on SoundCloud yet. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you really balance things nicely too. Uh, Chris Morton is playing drums on it. By the way. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that now that you mentioned that. <clears throat> of course, you were doing the bass guitar. Yeah. And uh, I'm assuming all the other instrumentation too. Uh, yeah, it, the rest of it is like mini, mini keys. the base underneath that right there oh yeah oh yeah i like that <laughs> holy cow yeah fingers are moving man <laughs> fell in love with 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 a uh, oh, traditional jazz at a younger younger age because I grew up in Louisiana I guess mm -hmm. um, but I, then I fell in love with, with smooth jazz which it feels like this is somewhere in between those two whenever I spend some that, time it's forward. interesting uh, when when, uh, when it's when it's wrapped up I'll talk about it a little bit uh, but that's exactly what I was going for cool. Very nice. Um, I, will, I do want to ask you what went into that, where the different ideas came from, how they came together, where the idea, the original came from, and just how everything that went into that to make it what it is. Uh, before we do that, though, I think there's one this important logistical question, um, and that's um, if people want to listen to some of your creations, is there a way for them to do that? I know oh, yeah. you're always worried about copyright issues and things like that, and I, but I tell you what, I've had my I've had my my battles with with those questions over the years in in various kinds of work from music to literature, um, mm -hmm. and there's always this battle of do I just put it out there and just share it with people, which you know, and and run the risk of somebody robbing my stuff, and do I care about that even, you know, and and I don't know, I don't know, but I, I really, as as an artist, you you a lot of times you're really making it to share with others, right? Yeah, and uh, uh, and some of those cons old concerns about theft and copyright really keep you from doing that sometimes. So, is there a way for people to get to hear this stuff, uh, you, you know, your, your compositions, if they want to? Uh, yeah, so uh, I do post them on the, the Jazz for Veggies blog once in a while. Um, so they do pop up there every now and then. I also, I have a YouTube channel that is kind of a, a whole mess of 
various things, videos and, and songs. I mean, it's just youtube.com slash J Simon off um, that, that I put original material once in a while up there too, and also not original material. Um, but I, I share pretty much everything that like pretty much everything in some way I share it uh, somewhere. If, if it's my own creation, if it's, uh, if I'm working on something like for someone else, I don't always share it. But um, since that one is a original composition, it is up on the Jazz for Veggies blog uh, from just a, I don't know, a couple months ago, I believe. Yeah, yeah, I really like that piece. So yeah. tell us about how, where the idea came from. How did you come to the idea for this piece? What happened that, what was the first thing? I don't know about you, when I'm writing a song, um, sometimes, sometimes it starts, it usually starts with a, a, a phrase. Because mm -hmm. I'm thinking more lyrical. I come from a more lyrical, you know, standpoint. Yeah. I think of a phrase um, or or a concept for a phrase, and, and that's where it starts for me. And then everything else just starts falling into place from that. There's a certain yeah. mood or or vibe or groove that I'm getting from that phrase, and that kind of informs what kind of rhythm I'm going to have, the kind of instrumentation I'm going to put onto it. How does it start for you, though? Uh, so I, I mean, we all I think we all start where we're most comfortable. And so for me, it starts always with like a harmonic harm harmony and baseline. Like that's, that's mm -hmm. where I build a baseline based on uh, like something that catches my ear harmonically um, because that's where I'm most comfortable. Uh, you know, we, we, I think we're creatures of habit in that sense. So uh, I, I even, I pointed out a little bit when the song was going, there's a, I think it would be like halfway through, there's this kind of underneath baseline that's very, it's moving around a lot. And um, I had, uh, taken uh, a lesson. I, I sometimes do um, take lessons with this guy in New York named Evan Marion. I do uh, Skype lessons with him because he's uh, a bassist that I respect and he's a professional and get a lot of cool ideas from him. And one of his, one of his, uh, I mean, do you, do you want to get like deep, like music theory stuff? Is that cool to talk about? That's totally cool. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, so we're going to have, I'm, I, I'm, I will be doing another interview today. Um, and we're going to talk about some of those other creative things that aren't music. you like, like sewing and, and ceramic and, and that yeah. kind of thing. So I don't think, I, I like to really, really just let people dive into whatever their thing is. And yeah, so please. All right. So yeah, so here's uh, Evan Marion's like kind of focus on how he writes is he, he uses these really open sounding scales and he calls them hexatonic scales, which is basically just a six note scale. And it's, it's derived from a whole tone scale, which is uh, you know, a scale mm -hmm. comprised entirely of whole tones. So it's got this very open kind of modern sound to it. And it doesn't, it doesn't fit in a box um, because it can kind of go in a lot of different directions. It's not quite major and it's not quite uh, mixolydian. It's not quite minor. It kind of like, it, 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 it doesn't want to be defined, but you can use it in a lot of different ways. Uh, mm -hmm. It sound good because so, you know, when you have like your triad, so you have a, the song, I believe it, it focuses around uh, I want to say a my a, a it sounds the, the solo it's the center of a so if you're if you have like an a chord you know a c sharp e you can keep going like you can keep adding thirds stacking thirds on top of that and eventually you fill out to your what they call extensions like your sevenths and your ninths and your thirteens um uh, and elevens and and those those tensions are beautiful in my opinion they just have a lot of beauty to them and they add a lot of color to your sound. And so these hexatonic scales, they complement extensions really well because they're basically playing around the extensions. So right, of, yeah, of course, right, yeah. that makes sense. So, so the, the, the harmonic structure of this, instead of thinking of like this in the key of A, because it's, it's not, but it's got a tonal center of A mm -hmm. and everything around it is the extensions. And even though you might say like, well, how does a, um, how does a C, natural fit with a C major, I'm sorry, a C natural fit with an A major chord because an A major chord has a C sharp. But if you start thinking of it as extensions, like, like, a, um, like a sharp 11 or a flat 13 or something like that, you can get these extra notes in there. So it opens up all these options yeah. harmonically of what you can do and melodically. Um, so that's, that's where that came from. Like the idea came from, I was like, if I'm playing around on this A sound, I can put these chords around it and it still sounds cool. It just kind of gives us this modern, like kind of twang to it, I guess. And what else could I do that would make a modern sound? Well, I went with these like electronic synthy kind of things and that do, 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 very, like, very almost like drum machine synth kind of sound. And so like I built this bass line and then I said, well, what complements that bass line? And like all the pieces kind of were there and I just had to find ways to, to meld them together. Yeah. Oh man, you said so many things there. 
That was so <laughs> cool. Uh, first of all, I, I, I think the, you said two adjectives that I think, you know, when you said them and that, and I was like, yeah, that ter- perfectly describes it. That, that structure, um, that, that what you call a hextonic scale and the openness of those chords, the open, it op- very, a very open, liberating, you know, feel yeah. to be able to dance up and down that and create new, new t- um, cues, more, more, yeah. you, know, you know, colors. And then, and then, and at first I never thought, thought of applying that um, adjective to it, but you said twangy. But the, I think it's what you talked about is there is that sense, even though the notes are spread out over those extensions to create that openness, there is still that little bit of dissonance because they're sometimes they're overlaying just a half, half a tone, yeah. semitone apart, right? Yeah. Or half a yeah. tone apart. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then what you said in the end is one thing you really highlighted a, a, a pro- part of the process of being creative that um, I think everybody does on some level, but they don't realize it and don't realize just how much fun they can have with it. Um, and that's the way, you're on, you're like, you're on an adventure. You had this one thing. And when you were there, you were already in this new, it, it took you so far into this journey. And once you got to that part of the countryside, you looked around and say, Hmm, Oh, so this is close to that over there. I think I can use that yeah. in my journey. And, and it's yeah. like one thing was, it was like this adventure and you didn't know exactly how the whole thing would be when you started, but you knew as you did it, all this stuff started fitting naturally and organically with it. Yeah. And yeah. you know, that's just, it's like, it's like, it's like a kid, um, it's like going on an adventure. They leave and they're wanting to collect inf- interesting experiences and they go on a quest, right? Mm-hmm. And the quest, by the end of the quest, this is how the journey came together. Um, it's it's kind of it's kind of the way we used to as kids. It's a type of play. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I like to I like to think of like a fusion is a is a style of music, but yep. fusion is a lot of. I mean, the word has more meaning to that. And I I don't I don't I like to think of as you said, like music is adventure, art is an adventure, it's a fusion of things. I think the best, the best kind of art and, and not just music, but other, you know, food included and, and made, like it's things that fuses ideas together because if you try to stick to just one genre, it's oh. all been done, you know, and that, that's, it's kind of played out and like it's gonna make things predictable and why, why be predictable when you can, we have the ability to do so much and connect so many things now yeah. in interesting ways. Why not do that? Like I, 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 if I had to say my favorite thing about music is that you can combine genres. My least favorite thing about music is that we think in genres. Like mm-hmm. I, I don't, I don't like to put things in a box and, and um, I don't, I, I, I for painting, since uh, painting is I don't know, on my mind now, like if you, if you, I don't know, I don't know anything about painting, so I could be just talking nonsense right now, but if you can <laughs> combine charcoal and oil painting and I don't know, watercolor all together, maybe you're going to get something beautiful. I don't know if that actually would happen, but like that's in my mind, it makes sense. And yeah. the same thing with music, like I don't want to be anything that you put in a box. If you hear, if you're writing like a country song that you want to use jazz harmony, why not? Like, like see what happens. And you might have to be a little tasteful. You might have to tweak a little bit to make it work, but there's no reason why anything has to be one thing and just in a box, in a square. Yeah. It can be anything. And I think that's something that we have to try to do as artists is experiment and combine and see what comes out of it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the classes, one of the classes I teach is African-American literature. And I, I made a cornerstone of that class. Um, some of the philosophies of Langston Hughes um, and, and, and the principles used in Harlem Renaissance, you know, I mean, you can't, you can't teach African American literature and not talk, talk, not talk about Harlem Renaissance. Right. Um, but one of the things that African American literature celebrates openly, um, because it had no other choice, you know, these people were, you know, brought over here forcibly from their homes and they were stripped of all their culture and told they couldn't use their own languages. Um, so they were forced to, to take the scraps of leftover stuff that they can remember and and the pieces they were getting from the other slaves around them and the pieces they were also hearing and and taking in from the white you know from the white people who had enslaved them and they were forced to make a brand new culture yeah they were forced to cobble it together so one of the things that has has made african american art and music so powerful and such an influence in this country is the fact that they were okay realizing i am recombining things i'm it's it's I don't, I can't be original because all, everything that was originally me has been stripped. Um, so I've got to just cobble together the pieces that I have 
And so they, they have incorporated that notion of taking what exists and playing with it. Yeah. And that's what, that's what, see, I mean, you had the spirituals, you know, they, the spirituals, they didn't, they couldn't all have a hymnal in their churches because they weren't allowed to have literature and learn how to read. So they would have one copy. And so they would do call and response, right? And so they yeah. started playing with the form that way, using what they had and using it in a new way. And that led to blues. And that blues was we have a real basic structure, but then we're going to push the envelope to see how we can play over that structure. Yeah. And then jazz was the next level of that. Yeah. And, and, and you said something interesting. And it kind of in the word twangy, the way you use twangy, normally you say twangy and you say music, country music, right? Um, <laughs> but you used it to talk about jazz, and you were absolutely right. Um, and I would say, even if you, what, what people who really say, oh, you know, I like rock, I like country, and they're really stuck in these genre boxes, um, what they don't realize is they're saying, I love African-American music, or, or I, love, I love music that's been influenced by African-American tradition, yep. right? Yep. Because there would be no modern country, there would be no modern jazz, there would be no modern rock if it had not been for the blues and for jazz, which is straight out of African-American, yep. recombinant, the recombinant creativity of, of the African-American you know, culture in our country. Yeah. Um, so it, yeah, I remember one of the things that inhibited me when I was younger, I was always driven to create and to make uh, mm -hmm. musically. I used to draw when I was a kid um, and I thought I was going to do that in my life. And I found out I didn't like to draw that like eight hours a day when I started quit mm -hmm. taking graphic design in college and realized, okay, not for me. Um, yeah. But one of the things that inhibited me was this notion that everything I said or did or wrote or created had to be absolutely original. I could oh. use no old material, <laughs> no. and that's impossible. Everything, yeah. that, everything that we are, it, it, we've inherited, and yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, um, let's let's hear another one of those pieces. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's hear another piece. Um, you want me to just go down the list, or do you have we have yeah, grass let's, fondant, ripples, and sprouts? Let's, let's yeah, let's go down the list. That sounds okay. good. Okay. This would be Brass Fondant. Yeah. Titled by Chris Morton. <laughs> shifted there to create a different movement. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Thank you. Uh, okay, so the, with the last piece, we talked about how the idea, where the ideas came from and how it took shape. Uh, mm -hmm. For this one, let's talk about, um, let's, let's talk about how it, and this is kind of a similar question that I asked for Chris, but it was a, for his literature. Mm -hmm. um, how does it go from a thing in your head to a thing in your hand? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Uh, so I, I would say 
it ha it's a matter of, of practice um mm -hmm. spend, spend your time like like you when we were talking before the song played you, you mentioned that you thought that everything one of your hindrances was everything you did had to be per you know original um another thing i think another loophole that people fall into is like they think everything that they make has to be a hit like i'm talking about music i guess everything that you if it's not going to be number one it's not worth doing um but I, I disagree with that. I think we have to, just like anything else in life, we have to practice to, to, to you might write a hundred, I might write a hundred bass lines and find that only five of them really have potential to go anywhere. Um, but I still have the practice of writing 100 things. And I think mm. to get it out of my head and into, you know, a space where people can hear it, it it's come over time of just doing it a lot. Um, uh, my phone is filled with little snippets of like, melodies and stuff that I've sang yep. or chord progressions that I've jotted down yep. and it might just be you know letters and in my mind I hear the shape and the letters kind of give me some outline to it but I have to like sit with an instrument and actually make it real and it's just I, I there's no short I don't know I don't think there was a shortcut for me to do that I just had to do it a lot to say okay I kind of hear this direction okay, here it is. And I've been able to figure it out when I was first writing and I've been writing music for a long time. It wasn't like that. It was more, I'm going to put this note here and just see what happens. And it was, you know, not, there was no method to it. Now I can actually make what I hear into reality because I have made so many things a reality over time. So uh, I think there's no, I don't, I don't know, for me, I don't think there was a a trick to it. It was just, I've done something like this a lot. If I know that the melody is going to go this direction, I need to make it go this direction. And I use my, my, where I'm comfortable, a bass guitar to do it. I write almost 90% of what I do on a bass guitar. So I'm comfortable there. I can manipulate the instrument to match what I hear in my head. Yeah. There's a, a lot of things you're saying um, that you're not, that you, that's, that's built into what you're saying over a lot of things underneath what you're saying. You're saying. For instance, you talked about how, you know, spending, spending all that time learning, you know, trying a hundred different ones produces a handful of things that you, you, you think have great potential and they're wonderful. So there's that, there's that notion of you do it a lot. And by doing it a lot, you, you get a smaller percentage of, of really high quality stuff that you're proud yeah. of. Right. Um, and then there's that whole, uh, you know, implied, implied notion that you doing it a lot also makes you, makes you better able and more skilled uh, later at expressing the next thing that comes along because, yeah. because you're, you know, it, one of the things I said, we said with Chris, we did the same thing. I did the same thing in the interview with Chris of using painting as an analogy and not being a painter at all myself. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, the painter can really paint whenever the brush becomes an extension of his hand. And then I said, <laughs> well, I assume because I'm not a painter, um, <laughs> but I think that's true. Right. It's, it's um, all that time you're spending making. You're also, you're also turning that bass, that bass guitar, into something that just it goes there on your body right yeah. it, it's yeah. your hands it's like me i can tell you right now that's an octave yeah <laughs> on a piano i know that's an octave i'm not i'm nowhere near a piano keyboard but on a, on a regular size full-size keyboard that's an octave mm -hmm. right um and why is that that's because i spent so many hours on on the dang piano right yeah. um so there's that aspect of it now you talked about how how it comes into becoming something real on your instrument. Um, but obviously we didn't just hear the bass guitar, by the way, to audience uh, out there. Um, if just in case you hadn't made the connection and you don't know John and Chris, um, I am right now talking to the gentleman that Chris described as having 17 fingers on each hand. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I encourage you to go back and listen to those tracks. There are times when John is playing it very straight and, and very, uh, and use in really doing more of a rhythm thing and just providing that root note for stuff. Um, and then there's other times when it is just wonderful fun up mm -hmm. and down the scale. Yeah. And, 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 but at the same time, because it's the bass and because John is such, so good at balancing the levels and frequencies within a composition. Um, sometimes you don't pick it right out. So I encourage you go back and listen to these pieces Go up on jazz for veggies, listen to his pieces, and, and listen specifically to what he's doing on that bass guitar because, uh, man, there's some really magic stuff going on there. So anyway, um, so you talked about how it, how it becomes actual piece in your hand. Now, how does it become a piece uh, that's, that's in other people's hands and, and ears and head? Yeah, so uh, I, I have 
um, a setup. It's upstairs. I'm, I'm down in the kitchen right now. Uh, setup upstairs where I have a, a laptop that I de dedicated to um, uh, recording. I have like bass amps and bass guitars and stuff behind me that I use for the, the quality sound. I also have a MIDI keyboard uh, next to me and I have uh, two programs that I uh, record music with. One of them is called Reaper and the other one's called FL Studio. Um, and so I, I and, then, and then I have another, like a, we have a personal computer downstairs uh, that I have a program on called Sibelius. Uh, Sibelius is my notation software. Like, so all my um, syndicate charts I do on Sibelius. So, so you just like, thought you could keep music confined to upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't happen. It just keeps growing, doesn't it? <laughs> yep. Uh, so uh, all the notation stuff happens down there. Like that's how we can get, you know, pieces for trumpet and stuff like that. Um, I, so I usually will fiddle on the bass, figure out what I want to do, and I notate it um, on, on Sibelius so that I have like the actual music. I'm not a keyboard player. I'm not a very, I should say I'm not a good keyboard player. Um, so like in that last song, there was a little like synth solo. That's me playing keys. I just wanted to see if I could make a solo on a, on a keyboard kind of thing. It's not anything like life changing as far as piano goes, but like I just use this little, I don't know, it's like 16 keys and I was able to fill around with that, but that's about, that's about the extent of it. But on a computer, like, it can play anything for you. So sometimes I can't physically make the stuff happen that I want to happen that I hear in my head uh, because I'm just not, I'm not that, I don't have the facility on the, like a keyboard or a guitar even. I, you know, I'm okay, but the bass is really all I can play well, I would say. But the computer will, will turn it into those sounds that you hear. So I, I program, it's called uh, programming, MIDI programming, put the notes in. Sometimes you have to just like click each individual note over a grid of where you want them to happen. And when you click the play button, the computer does all the, the work for you. And I'm not, I'm not trying to like diminish people that, I'm not saying that um, it's easy to do <laughs> and people that actually can play it is better off that way, but um, at least lets me have a, a voice when I can't make the stuff happen the way that I want it to happen. So like, uh, I'm trying to think about, well, I wrote that last one a long time ago, but those background like chords and stuff, I'm pretty sure that I was able to play the individual chords, but the solo, I would try it out. I'd try to play something and then I would use the, the, the MIDI grid where the notes were input and I was able to like move them around to be in time for where they needed to be and for what I heard. So uh, that's, that's like my setup, my recording setup. Um, and it, it wasn't like expensive to set up, but it does pretty well, I think, for like setting up, getting sounds out that I want to get out for what I can't physically, right. musically play. Yeah. yeah. You make good demos and, and, and you know, it, I think one of the things you're you're getting at there is it's a it's a little bit harder to do that in the moment expressive creativity that we love to do when we're playing live on that in that format. That's not to say it can't be that there's not tools out there that can help you you know overcome that. Um, but even when even if that's the case, that doesn't that doesn't mean or diminish the fact that that whole vision and composition, how all these different parts are fitting together, that act of creativity. Um, is, is still very much, you know, happening. And that's the reason, you know, for people who don't play music and they say things like, well, they're just using computers and cheating. You just, you just don't understand all the all math. Holy cow. Is math an important, important tool for scoring music? Holy cow, the math, right? Um, but yeah, in, in just to have the vision to see all the parts and that only comes, like you said before, by spending all that time and exposure uh, in your craft, right? The more you do it, the more you can see how these different parts, and you not only see how the parts have fit together, but you also see in different ways you can fit them together that, yeah. new, that you haven't seen combined in that way before. And and all of that vision and create, create creative energy is even there, even when we're having to use electronic mm -hmm. secondary sources to input notes in a mathematical way. You know, we we have the tools now, and there's anybody can be an artist in a lot of different capacity because the tools exist and why, why yeah. not take advantage of those tools? I, I, you could spend your whole life trying to learn how to play every instrument and then learn, you know, be able to create these, but that's, you know, no, not everyone has the time for that. I don't, I don't, I do this. All I do is play music all day. Pretty much. I don't have the time to learn every instrument to the capacity that I want it to sound. So I have to use tools and they're available now. We are so fortunate to live in a time where those things are out there for everyone. So we should take advantage of those. Yeah, as you as you know from my from things I've said in the past, when we've, when we've been able to go to practice, I'm missing you guys, by the way. Um, 
is uh, is I've I've fallen in love recently with GarageBand. You know, it's been on my phone. I mean, I've had it on, I've had an iPhone for years and years and years, and and I just always thought, eh, it's a little cheap piece of software. It's free. It do but man, holy cow, it's really it's really got some great options and some decent sounds in it. Um, yeah. And no, I can't I can't be as expressive in it as I can, but I can definitely lay down a good backing track. Yeah. Then, because it actually allows for audio recording too. I can then mm -hmm. go sing my vocals over that. I, yeah. I, I can play a, a, my new dulcimer that I built. I, I actually, I'm getting <laughs> okay enough that I feel confident I can strum and create some chords um, and play that into GarageBand and, and, and play my melodica and other instruments into GarageBand. Um, and it's a free software that comes on people's phones and iPads now. Yeah. It's free. It's absolutely free, you know? So uh, yeah, got, you know, people out there that you're stuck in your house and you can't go anywhere, You've got a you've got a Mac device, an Apple device, and you've got GarageBand. If you want to learn some how to do some things, you just just start playing around. It's all about playing. Just play yeah. and experiment. There's no one saying you've got to be the next the next you know chart topper like John said. Or just have fun. Yeah. One of my uh, one of my biggest inspirations in music was Dr. Peter Martin. He was my conducting teacher at USM. Um, uh, great great guy. Uh, just wonderful teacher and one of the things he said that always stuck out with me is like we don't call it working music we call it playing music because it's supposed yeah. to be fun you're playing music and you're right on you just play have fun with it try stuff out there's no reason not to yeah yeah absolutely well um let's hear one more piece to kind of wrap up the show here um and uh, i have had a great great time by the way um, me too thank you for, for yeah, having this, me. Been, this has been wonderful and this is going to be ripples this is yeah. an older track um, written with the image of water. Now that's interesting. Give us a description of of what you mean by that. Written with the image of water. Before we listen to it. So I, I, I don't, and I don't have, I don't have this. But there's a there's a condition. I, I call it a condition. There's a, a a thing called synesthesia, and it's it's basically like some people have when they hear notes, they see colors. Like a yeah. note is associated with a color. I don't have. I don't have that, but I do have like I I don't even know if it's a, if I what if it would be called the same thing. But sometimes when I hear combinations of chords, like chords, like I see an image in my head, like it just kind of appears. I don't know how to how else to describe it. And this is yeah. And um, the chord progression that I was making up when I worked on this one, like I saw I saw a lake, like it just like it appeared to me, and so I I kind of had that image in my head and I kept writing trying to maintain that image and the chords I think have like a lot of color to them um, and then I I had um, another syndicate member uh, uh, Brandon or Jake <laughs> Jake uh, play saxophone on it because yeah. uh, he's got this kind of very beautiful melodic sound when he plays he does, and, he does. yeah and so we we took took that imagery and I just tried to make things that fit it never made me lose that image of water. And I, I don't want to say that I have synesthesia because like, I don't see colors like that, but I think like the, the, the something, something happened where like I hear that sound and I'm on a lake or something. And so I just try to maintain that. Um, yeah. Now, now here's the thing. I really love what you just said. I think it's totally cool. I think it gives a window into, into the head of, of, of how an artist thinks. Um, but at the same time, I know that there will be people who who watch this video, listen to the video, who would say, see, I don't think that way. That's why I'm not creative. And they'll think that's some unique thing. But I want to say to those people, uh, there's a reason that John is seeing these connections and that other artists see these connections this way. It's because they, they're not buying into the genre boxes, yeah. into these demarcations and say, this is, goes here and this goes here. When you knock down those barriers, and that's what synesthesia does, right? It knocks down this notion of the barrier between the, this is a sense of sight and this is a sense of sound, right? Yeah. Um, and it knocks down the barrier and says, hey, no, let's just see what it triggers, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, uh, I know that I don't, I've heard that biologically speaking, the whole notion of right brain, left brain is actually biologically not, not really what they have people described it to be. But there's definitely some truth to, to the philosophical side of that, to where it's like a different closing down all those voices that tell you what things have to be mm -hmm. and say, eh, who cares for a minute and just yeah. letting, letting the brain roam. Like um, it. And it allows you, opens you up to connections that you never would have made before. So thank you for saying that. All right. So let's listen to ripple.
He is smooth, isn't he? Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. He's got a super great sense of melody. When he writes, he, he writes great melodies. And he, he needs to, I think, needs to tap into that more because he can write beautiful melodies. He knows exactly when to layer in a little vibrato in there. Yeah. So, yeah, the, um, the recording, We'll continue on. Like we we set up, I actually gave that to him. Um, at, at that recording, if he wanted to use, I don't know if he did or not, but for his college audition. So it's got oh. an empty section in the middle there. Me just playing, and he was able to improvise. So there's nothing. <laughs> there's no mo mo melody right there, and then it comes back like a jazz standard would. So you have your, your head, your improvise, and then the head again. So that was like that was giving him a chance to practice with that. So uh, it just repeats itself. But uh, I think in that first chunk before the the core changes just kind of bam you can i for me that just it feels like feels like water i don't know i don't know <laughs> yeah, i would see that kind of this light the ripple of waves kind of kind of rippling up against this gets the shoreline there you know and yeah. foamy bubbles yeah absolutely cool very cool well man i have had a great time and we're going to just let that track keep playing as we fade out here cool. um, but i thoroughly enjoyed it it was it was really good to get to actually see your face again mm -hmm. and 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 Hopefully soon, when the we'll be able to get back together and start making some tunes together, and Star City Syndicate will be will be back. I, I've had fans reach out since we released Chris's video saying we miss you guys, you know, and and of course we miss them too. We miss each other. But anyway, man, take care of yourself, you and Janet. Stay safe, and uh, can't wait to see you again. Awesome. Thanks for having me.